Hi, everyone, and welcome to Keynote Creative Dialogue. My name is Tala Khan Malek, she, they, and I'm wearing a yellow button-up shirt with a white, red, and purple oval pattern. In the background is a cream-colored wall, a dark gray couch, and a bookshelf with books, plants, and photographs. Welcome to our second keynote of the symposium, which is a creative dialogue. To access the live transcript, click live transcript on your Zoom screen and then show subtitle. For more information on accessing the live transcript, please visit the link that's being dropped in the chat now. We encourage everyone to use the chat during the panel to affirm the panelists, quote them, express reactions to their work, to each other, share resources, and more. In fact, right now, as a practice, I invite everyone to put a one word description of how they're feeling in the chat. Special thanks to our co-sponsors of this dialogue. <clears throat> Excuse me. Writing Black Lives, an initiative of Boston University's African American Studies and the BU Center for Humanities. I'm seeing excited, pumped, shook, inspired, connected, loving. I will now briefly introduce our speakers. Dr. <clears throat> excuse me, Dr. Crystal Wilkinson, she, her, is an award-winning author, Kentucky's poet laureate and professor of English at the University of Kentucky. Dr. Alexis Pauline Gums, she, they, is also an award-winning author, artist, activist, media maker, and a 2022 National Endowment of the Arts Creative Writing Fellow. For the speaker's complete biographical information, please visit the link being dropped in the chat now. Our intention for this creative keynote is to bring together two writers of Blackness, gender, and sexuality with a special love for the Black South and Black Appalachia to engage in a free form dialogue about the impact of Jones's work on their own work and the wider creative world. In some ways, the distinction between creative and critical is provisional slash artificial. As we highlighted yesterday, our most critical work is always creative. <clears throat> And our creative work is an integral and critical read of our world and its possibilities. This session will begin with opening remarks from Drs. Wilkinson and Gums. Then we will transition into a free form, unmoderated conversation. During the final 30 minutes of this session, organizer Iana Hawkins Owen will join Drs. Wilkinson and Gums on screen to open the audience question and answer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Crystal Wilkinson and I'm wearing pink cat eye glasses, um, short locks and a pink dress. Behind me is a mess of books, uh, a Sankofa statue, um, and various plants. I told an audience a, a few years ago that I had given up this notion of homogeneity uh, in my fiction. Why can't omniscient sound like my grandmother, I asked them. Why can't a woman like my country black grandmother be God? Why can't I think of point of view as my grandmother riding the back of a bird through the story. 
Gail Jones helped nurture this idea. I found myself in Jones's writing, Kentucky, Black, rural, woman. I was especially taken with how she drew characters from the oral storytelling tradition and then broadened that form into her own style, her own literary style. I saw Jones's act of making Black speech the core of her work as like the work of Tony K. Bambara as something revolutionary. I discovered Jones in the 90s um, when she made a rare appearance and read from her work at the University of Kentucky when I was a beginning writer. I read all of Jones's books in the order that she wrote them. When I was in my MFA program, I wrote my primary critical um, essay on Jones's work and focused on her unflinching eye, her use of first person point of view. John Updike described Jones as an American writer with a quote, powerful sense of vital inheritance of history in the blood, end quote. I immersed myself in her work and rediscovered the history in my own blood and regained plausibility and verisimilitude in my stories, the characters and their voices. It was Jones's pure freedom to work within the vernacular that convinced me that my work could be both literary and true to the traditions of my culture and my people. I fell deeply into a writing fury that would produce the short stories in my second collection, Water Street, and the initial chapters of what would eventually become my first novel, The Birds of Opulence. Because the first person, I, can often be mistaken for the writer's personal voice, I teach writing students how to extend their voice. I teach them the magic that can occur when they, like Jones, allow the reader to be intimately engaged with the consciousness of the people they create. Jones once stated that she believed first person to be the most authentic way of telling a story, and I agree. Her novels and short stories give voice and power to the silenced and to the silence, particularly silenced women. Reading her work gave me permission to center a story on a protagonist who lives in a black rural community, but it was even more empowering to know that I could let the characters tell the story, which even through the telling would give the character more agency. In an interview, several people have talked about this interview with Michael Harper, Joan says that at the beginning of her career, she felt that she was using her own voice, writing the way she would speak. But when she was in graduate school, her narrative strategy changed as she began to make cultural connections to oral traditions. That relationship, further led her, Jones writes in Black Women Writers, people have talked about this one too, to an interest in, quote, the psychology of characters and the way in which they order their stories, their myths, dreams, nightmares, secret worlds, ambiguities, contradictions, ambivalences, memories, imaginations, their puzzles, she says, end quote. As Jones's characters reveal the circumstances of their lives, there's no censor from other characters or from the author. The discourse in Jones's fiction is most always black and feminine and sometimes tragic, but always strong and uncompromised. The reader is held there, perhaps wiggling sometimes from discomfort, but equally intrigued and lost in lofted to some next level of understanding, understanding about the character, circumstances, the world, understanding about themselves as a reader. Under Jones's gifted hand, the teller of the story is always an intimate observer or participant, making the story seem more tangible, more real. In Corregidora, the reader is firmly grounded in the narration of Ursa. An interior monologue throughout the novel takes the reader through Ursa's psychohistory. 
Corregidor's emotional and physical impact on the family is delivered through Ursa's memories, her absorption of oral tradition, the magical pulsing of family history in the blood. In an interview with Charles Rao, um, editor of Callaloo, Jones recalls giving a talk about Corregidor and someone being surprised that she, Jones, didn't speak like her protagonist. Jones said, quote, the implication of course was that I was more articulate, at least within an acceptable linguistic tradition, but always with black writers, there's the suspicion that they can't create language voices as other writers can, that they can't invent a linguistic world in the same way other writers can. For instance, she said, I couldn't imagine that the same professor having made such a comment to Joan Didion or Margaret Lawrence regarding the possibilities of their linguistic imagination. Jones is resolute about her narrative choices. In the interview with Harper, she says, quote, I like to write things that sound like they really happened. When I tell a first person story, it has to be like it really happened. I have to identify so closely with it, like in the oral storytelling tradition, that it really happened. And the woman telling the story is really telling the story. I'm not telling the story. The person telling the story is telling it. That is something that I've probably read that quote hundreds, maybe even thousands of times over the years as I've written. And for a period of time, I kept it over my writing desk. I'm not telling the story. The person telling the story is telling it. Jones has been my long-term mentor on the page, uh, though we've never met face to face, though we live in the same city less than 10 minutes uh, from where I live now. In 2011, when my partner and I opened our bookstore, we wanted to name it, um, and I'm gonna pronounce it wrong, Zarke or Zark after the title of one of Jones's collections of poems. Ultimately, we decided to name our bookstore The Wild Fig after Gail's, uh, Gail's poem, Wild Figs in Secret Places. One of my favorite sections of the poem says, memory is a mosquito pregnant again and out for blood. Reading Jones helps me write fictional lives that reflect my own experience as black and woman and rural. Just as she does, I try to lend an unflinching eye to the lives of my characters. And I see my job as a writer to create a space where silence can exist and which silenced individuals can speak to each other speak to me as the writer and speak to the reader. I, like Jones, don't often write directly to politics, but this amalgam of personal memory, historical memory and imagination, the act of writing these characters, the act of drawing from the diaspora of storytelling traditions and the act of making black vernacular the core is political. I had to say to myself, how much more political, revolutionary really, can you be than to give a country black woman the freedom to tell her own story from her own mouth, from her own tongue, as though she is talking to her own people when much of the world refuses to acknowledge that she even exists. Of course, I got emotional at that point and scrolled down and lost all my notes. Um, So this idea um, to make 
the invisible visible, I think is one of the things that, that Jones does. Um, let the storytellers tell, let the characters tell, let them remind everyone that we exist. So why can't my omniscient narrator be my black god of a grandmother or someone like her? Why not? If I don't do it, then who will? When I write in the voices of my people, I'm paying homage to my matriarchs, the housekeepers, the granny women, the educators, the wives, the witches, the ones who bleed, the drumming black heart of girlhood, um, the drumming heart of black girlhood and black womenhood. But I'm not just regurgitating my own reality. I'm indeed attempting to write the purest fiction, always trying to scratch at the most authentic way of telling. Miss Gale, I use dialect and voice as literary tools, as weapons, as conduits to the ancestors because you do. You have taught me to examine the human mind, to attempt to create truths through the eyes and mouths of ordinary people. I write hoping that somehow the reader and I myself can see more clearly the human heart. Even after all these years, we, Black women writers are not always given credit for our linguistic imaginations. But I, I did it again. Um, scroll happy. We Black women writers are not always given credit for our linguistic imaginations. But I appreciate Gail Jones. I appreciate you always, always there in your fiction, in your interviews, on the pages of your critical work behind your closed door as you sit in your peacock's chair, wishing to be left alone, reminding me, reminding all of us to lean back into our people, their traditions, myths, dreams, nightmares, secrets, memories, our talk, and to place my anchor there. Like your Ursa said, shit, we're all consequences of something. And I'm a writer who is a consequence of you. And I wanted to um, close with just a short passage from The Birds of Opulence, in which I think you can hear um, Jones's inspiration. Um, so there's two girls in this and they're out in the woods. They giggle at the word naked upon open their eyes and look at each other, then break into laughter again. They roll out of the nest and pick a large bouquet of the dandelion weeds that have already begun to poke above the freshly mown grass. They place the fluffy balls above their heads at the crest of their circle. They roll back into the straw palm so close they almost touch. They lie on their sides with their faces toward each other like new lovers. Their lips come together and they kiss. Just a brief touching of lips, a kiss so light, so benign. Years later, this moment comes wistfully back, the dewy feel of lips, the milky smell of breath, the flutter of eyelashes touching for what must have been only milliseconds. You think I'm pretty, Mona says, and rolls onto her back, the sunburnt weeds prickling through her blouse. Yeah, me, yeah. I hope I'm pretty when I grow up. Me too. Yolanda doesn't say anything back, just looks up at the sky. They hold hands. They have never talked about Obie Simpson, but that day remains like a full cup, always threatening to spill over. Yolanda closes her eyes again, trying to shut it out. She can feel her plaits coiling on the back of her head, drawing up in a pool of sweat. A sweat bee circles around her eye so close to her ear that she can hear it's buzzing. Dot Heel's having a baby, Mona says. Nuh-uh, you lying. I could have a baby. I got my period, Mona says proudly like she's won a prize. She says it with conviction, a tone that makes Yolanda feel extraordinarily young and silly. Yolanda says nothing. They are quiet for a while, just leaning into each other, their shoulders touching. I bleed. 
No, you don't. I can have babies. Why ain't you told me? Cause you don't need to know everything. I would have told you. Well, I ain't you and you ain't me. Yolanda can feel her foot shaking, a twitching in her toes, a sign she can come on to come to count on most all her life. If I did it with a boy right now, Yolanda jolts up. She looks around to make sure no one hears before she responds. She clenches her teeth, tries to will the heat from stop to stop rising and spits out, Mona, you nasty, and you still got a baby pussy. Yolanda slaps Mona before she even thinks about it. Mona cups her cheek. Yolanda's mouth gapes wide as a fish's. She's sorry, but this too has already become part of their story. Wow, wow, wow. <sighs> Thank you so much for everything that you just shared. I, um, well, you know, I love the Birds of Opulence so much. And so it's beautiful to hear you, hear you read from it. And I've just been looking forward to this for so long. And I don't know, it feels like a hundred years ago that our divine, brilliant organizers we're like, this is gonna happen, you know, and do this. And I was like, yes, 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 yes. So this day has actually come. I'm super honored to be in conversation with you about the impact of the work of Gail Jones. And just wanna also acknowledge everybody who has presented already in this incredible symposium. It's been phenomenal. And I love how the form of this symposium also feels like a consequence of the approach that Gail Jones has taken. And so I'm really excited to get into the conversation part, but I am grounding myself in two artifacts really, mostly one, which is a, it's a, an explanation of what Corregidor is that Gail Jones wrote and it was enclosed in a, a letter that's part of her correspondence with Toni Morrison, which is part of, of Toni Morrison's collection that's at Princeton. And it's not 100% clear if she wrote this just because Toni Morrison said, explain what you're doing in Corregidora. It just says Corregidora at the top. Um, so it could have had other uses too, but it was written during that time in graduate school when Gail Jones was not only developing, but also very specifically theorizing her relationship to form. So I'm gonna read it once all the way through, and then I'm gonna read it again, kind of pausing with some things that I hope that we can talk about together, the two of us, and then you know all of us later on. Corrigadora is layers of storytelling rather than, quote, incorporating the oral story or storytelling. I try to use techniques from oral storytelling in the whole structure so that one has a sense of storytelling within storytelling. Such techniques from the oral story would be direct time, place, transition. In the oral story, for instance, one might speak of 1939 and 1969 in the same breath. The concept of the retold story. The oral story is revised by retelling the story of Mutt coming into Happy's Cafe being retold. The several layers of storytelling parallel time, present, past, distant past. This is underlined. In life, we know the felt past from what we are told. Rather than using flashbacks, I try to use storytelling 
my grandmother told my mama and my mama told me. I am interested in the relationship between storytelling and a conception of time. The oral story, like memory, can hold layers of time simultaneously. Time can be thought of more as a continuum than static moments. The relationship between generations can be thought of as a continuum. I am also concerned with the relationship between technique and social morality and human value. By using the perspective of the oral story, the narrator belongs to the same essential speech community and worldview as the other characters, instead of somehow being mysteriously lifted away in terms of perspective. I hope that this allows for the proper moral human perspective and the integrity and wholeness of not only the central character, but all the other characters in the story. Finally, I am concerned with the relationship between personal biography and collective history, whether the essentials of biography are changed by history, and also how biography often helps to put history in its proper moral and human perspective. Okay, I forgot to describe myself. So I'm Alexis Pauline Gums. I am wearing a red shirt and a blue shawl with flowers on it and some big silver earrings and some purple glasses and wild hair, some of it silver also. And around me is our shelves with books and other objects, including a jar of water from the Kambahi River. And uh, behind me to my left is a closed door. Okay, so this, I'm going back to this description and I just love it so much I could live inside it. I feel like maybe I do live inside it. Corrigadora is layers of storytelling. And so I feel like this, I see it in an archeological form. I see these layers of ground and the ground underneath and the ground underneath and the ground underneath. And of course, at this particular time, Gail Jones is writing about Corrigadora and explaining it, but as we know, and as actually has been pointed out over the last two days, this is very true for her larger body of work, right? There's storytelling and all of it. And we go on with the storytellers on the tangents of the stories that they are telling and their stories within those stories and their stories within those stories. And sometimes within the story is a whole other person's book that's also part of the story. So there's, there's all of this layering that's happening. And I love this rather than and this is in scare quotes, incorporating the oral story or storytelling. I try to use techniques from oral storytelling in the whole structure so that one has a sense of storytelling within storytelling. So there are all of these stories. There's the storytelling that's happening, but it's also held by this universe or archeology span of storytelling itself as an ethic, right? That we learn here includes not only the use of particular vernaculars, but also a sense of time, a sense of ethics, a sense of intergenerationality. Right, that that is the world. That's what's implied by a world of storytelling or storytelling as a form holding the actual storytelling that's happening. So these it's, techniques. Oh, did you did you want to did you want to say something? 
No, go ahead. Oh, okay. I'm, just excited. I'm just excited by what I'm you're so saying. I'm so excited. So the um, so I just going back over these techniques, the time travel that's possible, right? One might speak of 1939 and 1969 in the same breath, and the um my grandmother told my mama and my mama told me, right? The intergenerationality of the storytelling. And then I'm also really excited for us to think about this idea of how the oral story is revised by retelling. Mm -hmm. And it, I think actually in terms of the impact on my own work and how I see my own work here, the story being revised by the retelling and that function of repetition is one of the things that is one of the things that not only do I see it in my own work, but it's been really beautiful also to see it in this symposium in how many of us have created poetry inspired by Gail Jones and what it means to retell and revise in retelling in all of those different forms. But it also has me think, and you know, Sister Doctor. Ramalika Imhotep had uh, brought up Sylvia Winter earlier today around, around this, the idea of plot and plot and plantation, but I'm thinking about Sylvia Winter in terms of her description of our species as homo narans, right? The, the species that tells itself the story of itself and then believes that story. And this idea that the story can be revised by retelling is, um, is the place that I live. So I wanted to, to bring that into what, what does the retelling do? What even does the retelling do in the ways that we retell the stories that Gail Jones has offered? And then certainly, and this is so reflected in, in what you shared and, and what, um, something that I love so much about your work, Crystal, is this idea of a felt past that comes from what we've been told. And we've been told it out of, out of the mouths of our generations, right? My grandmother told my mama and my mama told me. And um, who, the, who does that telling and who we're invoking when we tell what we're telling, that, that consequence, that consequentialness, I wanna say consequentiality, I don't think that's a word, but can be now. <laughs> <laughs> is um, is felt and is I know it's what I'm listening for when I'm when I'm writing my own work when I'm listening for it to to come and especially when I'm revising it I'm listening for that feeling and that that feeling of it, yes that's it is a feeling in relationship with the generations of my of my ancestors and my teachers. And then this, this idea of, so the time, I want us to talk about the time travel, which comes up again here, but I'm also really interested in this idea of morality, integrity, and values that Gail Jones brings up here, because I think about it as, this idea that if the narrator and the storytellers within the story told, retold story are not lifted away and pretend objective narrators, but are situated within the story and the practice of storytelling, there's a theory of accountability that emerges there that is also really important to me, accountability quite, quite literally in terms of who gives an account, how can an account or a story be received and what is the appropriate transformation that happens in our practice of storytelling, understanding the community in which we're telling our stories, the communities that we're prioritizing when we tell our stories, the communities that have given us the felt histories that move through our stories. And that's actually, I mean, I guess I'm always thinking about Sylvia Winter, but that's also something about Sylvia Winter's 
theoretical work that I always go back to is, is situated, right? I, I go back to works by Sylvia Winter that she gave as speeches to a particular audience and, and then published in print. And there's something about who she was speaking to with what intent and what energy and with what accountability that is as much a part of what I have to learn from it as, as any, anything else any of the content of it, although the content of it, of course, is a consequence of all of that. And then this last thing about relationship between personal biography and collective history, what it means to put history in its proper perspective is so much, especially because um, I feel that Gail Jones has also been a writer who has said, like, don't impose all of this on my personal biography and how are the lives that she creates a way of changing history, putting history in its place, revealing the contingency of history. Um, I'm endlessly fascinated by it. So mm -hmm. that, that is one artifact. The other artifact that I'm just gonna invoke um, and just say that it's on my mind. I'm not, I'm not gonna show it. It's a picture of Gail Jones that I saw because it's, it's in a first edition of Corrigadora that is in, um, in Anne Ducille's collection at the Pembroke Center. It's part of the Black Theory Project, which is an archival project at the Pembroke Center at, at Brown. And it's, it's a picture that is on the inside cover of Anne Ducille's Edition because Gail Jones gave it to her because of, because of their um, their sisterhood collegiality friendship, and Gail Jones is sitting on a couch and maybe it's a stack of pictures or maybe it's a journal that's next to her and her hand is in front of her face and she's not looking at the camera and I like to imagine that it's a picture of Gail Jones listening and. I'm also thinking about that because in, in my creative practice, I, I identify first, foremost, and primarily as a listener. I'm listening and I'm, I'm listening to the people speaking around me. I'm, I'm listening for that voice, but I'm also listening to, to the invisible, to the unseen, unheard, and it's, it's the whole, it's the whole thing. Like if I would were to say what my methodology is, it's listening. And what I get from this idea of storytelling and it's, it's deep specificity and accountability, it's mobility through time, but it's accountability to community is a prioritization on listening, which, which I also feel reflected in your work so much, Crystal. So. Mm -hmm. That is my archival grounding. Um, I'm so excited about all the things we get to talk about. And again, I'm grateful for everything that you've shared and the conditions that allow us to be here together. Yeah, me too. Um, I, I don't think I had ever seen um, the, um, that excerpt that you shared and you shared with me, with me uh, a little earlier. Um, and I'll just say the way that I'm I'm built, it's gonna. I have to go back to the to the beginning to be at the beginning. You'll have to refresh me, or I won't I won't remember. So um, just to start at the end, the about the photograph and about listening. I mean, I think that I too see myself as a conduit. Um, before the conference this morning, I spoke with some other people. And um, honestly, they were mostly um, white folks. And I don't think they got the idea that I could write an eye, a first person point of view that was close to myself, but also outside myself. Mm -hmm. That I'm sort of as a writer sitting beside myself, being a conduit for um, this sort of combination of the ideas that I might have for the story, but mostly like you said, it's an act of listening. It's an act of opening myself up to see what the I, not what I sort of narcissistically have to say, but 
being an artistic conduit, what the ancestors are going to bring forward, what these characters and even the characters' ancestors are going to be bring forward. And perhaps they are um, in line with my own biography, but perhaps they're not. Mm -hmm. And to be open to that, to be open to both the discomfort if they are, if it is close to the bone, but to also be open to that uh, and to be open as an artist, at how far away they may take me from my own biography. Mm -hmm. And I'm still talking about writing fiction. Um, and I think because, you know, um, mainstream writing culture tells us that that's not how we're supposed to write, mm -hmm. which brings me back to the beginning, you know, mainstream uh, pedagogy around creative writing tells you that you need to lead with plot. Mm -hmm. And so all of the spirituality, um, all of the sort of collective memory or ancestral memory and paying attention to those things and, and thinking of that as being the divine is sucked out of it, of thinking that you need not your grandmother, uh, uh, your country black grandmother on a bird, but thinking that you need Walter Cronkite to sort of come in <laughs> and somehow deliver the stories of your, your black characters. Um, and so I think that sort of speaks to that, the idea of of the storytelling that you talked about um, at the beginning or that Gail talks about at the beginning and this idea of the layering because we're never, we're never just in the present. You know, um, I have a Sankofa behind me and that's sort of what the Sankofa bird, uh, the Sankofa bear bird is sort of moving forward, standing in the present, you know, possibly moving forward, but also looking over the shoulder uh, to look back at the past. And I think that's who we are uh, as a people that is sitting here in this orange chair in, in my body, uh, in, in my artistic body. Um, when I'm writing, I can't just think about a character and where they are now. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's moving both ways. It's oh, reaching that's... back for their history. It's reaching forward for, for what their future will be um, in each of those when you're talking about the time, each of those platelets of time contain information that you need to be open to as a writer. Yeah, I love the distance in it, you know, and I, I love that the time isn't, you know, past, present, future, it's present, past, distant past. Um, and, and yet that distance can be traveled you know, as, as she says here in one breath mm -hmm. and the actual breathing is, is important for me, you know, thinking about, and you said it, you know, embodied, my embodied artist self. Um, I think about a practice of listening, listening for a story that's being told and also about to be retold and you know all, all of that transformation it's transforming it's transforming whatever i that i may even have you know <laughs> narcissistically it's not going to be the same um after or really even during receiving and stewarding any story but there's also something that feels very personal about saying that in this em embodiment this this being this or this multicellular set of set of stuff <laughs> is available to the story and to its voices and to its own transformations and contradictions and interruptions and I wonder, I wonder too about that. Like I, when you said, you know, when it, when it comes close to the bone, 
those moments of discomfort when it comes close to the bone. I love the way you said that, first of all. And it made me think for myself about that as a, a kind of map or a song with different notes, you know, the, those places where it's like, oh, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes that, oh, is like, for me, it's like, oh, that's why I can hear this. That's why I have to write about this. It's like, oh, you know, like it's, mm -hmm. it, and, it, and it goes in and then it's like, okay, and then I'm just in the process. And then it's like, oh, you know, um, mm -hmm. and, I often have the experience of like, well, I thought I was writing about this because, you know, I had this great idea, but always I end up having to surrender to the fact that, well, first of all, I have no idea, but there's, there's a longing that, there's a longing that I was actually moving in service of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In and the story was there, you yes. know, that, that layering, um, I think, uh, even in Gail's case, I think that that layering comes from, um, you know, the, the past being within us, right? The past, the future, uh, not only is it out here, you know, sort of thinking about, but it's also within us, um, you know, stitched, tattooed in our DNA. Um, and when you're open enough to access it, that's, that's sort of that feeling like, oh, <laughs> Oh, <laughs> no. Okay. Oh, all right. You know, you kind of go through all of the emotions. Like, you know, a lot of times when I'm writing, my first inclination is to resist. And then I'm like, okay, let me relax. Let me, let me see what you're doing here. Um, and I, and I always feel like it's not just me, um, sort of at the screen or at the table or at the, the, um, the journal. Um, and I can't even write about a person, you know, I call my characters people, but I can't write about a character until they are a living, breathing person and, and not just knowing what they perhaps look like or even what I want their story to, what I think I want my story to be. You know, James Baldwin said, you don't get the story you want you get the story you get and I think sometimes that getting um was what was intended anyway by the higher power we just have sort of resisted and then there's a pinprick sort of in the sky and then all of a sudden it's like oh I didn't know that this world was even here um and then it's a whole other process to sort of process process it through your body to sort of look and 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 realize that that story was always uh, within you. And then there's a story within the story. Yeah. Like, especially when you you take something up, uh, whether it was, was your own idea or it was given to you by your, I don't know, by your process mm -hmm. and then sort of hold it up to the light. And you think you're looking at something. You're like, okay, I'm holding it up to the light, trying to figure out what this thing is. And suddenly, you know, you, you turn it a little bit and it's like, a, whoa, there's a whole other world in there. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's part of what she does and is able to do in a really short, short period of time. Um, and that's how we live in the world, right? This sort of, you know, scene to scene and some of the other, and it's not that that craft shouldn't be there. Cause I think that, that the elements, the structures of craft help us to control um the work but I think sometimes we're taught to control so much that you miss a lot mm -hmm. uh, because that's how we live as human beings we we're in the moment we're talking to a friend uh we walk by we smell a flower and suddenly we're remembering a funeral or remembering being in a field of flowers with a lover or we're remembering it's not just fluid like a Pam walking to the coffee shop to get my my latte, like there are things that happen on the way. And we forget that sometimes as, as writers and as creators um, when we're working inside the bodies and minds of our characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I love how Gail Jones writes about time. You know, like, yes, we can move through time in one breath like we do 
in life and that she has this idea like but it's not the the flashback versus the told story um is a different form of transportation mm -hmm. um, and it even i mean it even invites me to think about when i'm when i'm time traveling and i you know i'm walking by and that this is happening and that's happening and you know suddenly i'm in a a memory i guess i'm actually in a story about that memory mm -hmm. and it really matters for me in the so-called present moment what is the story I tell about that memory? What is the story I can tell about that memory that I wouldn't have been able to tell yesterday or I wouldn't have been able to tell without having talked to that friend or without the support of that flower, or, you know, like whatever, whatever those details are. And so the, this underlined portion of, of this, you know, small essay, because this is, this is not an excerpt, this is the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, not to say that it was an excerpt of something larger that she then distilled to send, but as an artifact, it's the whole thing. And that in life, right? In life, we, I wanna say it exactly. In life, we know the felt past from what we are told. I think mm -hmm. that that applies even if I'm the one telling myself the felt past. Right. And and what what I'm able to feel around it is it's part of the creativity. And I think for me, it's it's the longing, it's the practice, it's the desire that's underneath all of my creative work. You know, it's like I'm mm -hmm. training to just be able to tell myself. <laughs> the story of what's going on and what yeah. went on and what the consequences were and are in a way that allows me to feel what I need to feel now. Mm -hmm. And training for the listening, you know, you're training mm -hmm. for the, for the listening um, and being able to discern because, you know, the, the, the art comes in making a choice, you know, when, if you're, if you're living this life, and you're, you're writing about a character and you're, you're, you're in the interior. Um, and if you're in the interior of a character or in the interior of a story, there's, there's so many choices. If you know it well, there's so many choices. You could go anywhere. Like, you know, what great Graham said at this time, what did, but being able to choose carefully the layers so that they stack up to have great, meaning and great artistic meaning um, is another level of training, being able to discern which, which ones you bring in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the idea that it, it matters so much, you know, that, that that's one of the things about this, this piece, like that there's a whole morality, integrity, you know, those, those words, values in the choice we make of how we tell the story and that is more obvious to me when I'm, for example, right now making a choice about how I'm, how I'm saying this um, because of accountability to you, because of accountability to honoring Gail Jones and her body of work, because of accountability to this, you know, blessed gathering of like-minded people who um, I understand to be a, a community of affinity. And it actually matters just that much mm -hmm. with whatever I'm telling myself, but I don't always remember that. You know, I, I think that part of what this idea about the biography and collective and history makes me think about how important it is to understand myself at all times as a storyteller in community. Mm -hmm because it also has an impact on how I, how I can be accountable to this life, 
and mm -hmm. this embodied possibility and mm -hmm. all of the choices um, that it takes to be in the practices that I need to be in. You know, one of the, the yeah, yeah, absolutely. One of the the things that I can't remember exactly what she says about um, sort of being. She didn't use the word careful, but what does she say about um, writing in a way that all the characters have sort of equal importance or something like that in that um, you sent it to me. Let me see if I can pull it yeah, up. Um, I think it's the part where, okay, by using the perspective of the oral story, the narrator belongs to the same essential speech community and worldview as the other characters, mm -hmm. instead of somehow being mysteriously lifted away in terms of perspective, I hope that this allows for the proper moral human perspective and the integrity and wholeness of not only the central character, but all the other characters in the mm. story. Yeah. 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 And that's such a lens. Um, that I believe filters through perhaps all of her work when you think about it. That sort of um, idea, which like I said, is not what we're taught, this idea that um, the narrator is not white Jesus, white God, whatever, you know, like right. uh, it, the narrator is of the community. Right. Um, as much as the characters, the other characters are of the community. Um, one of the stories that, short stories that I love so much of hers that I that teach often and it sort of blows my MFA students away is um, Coke Factory, especially if they've never read Gail Jones and they sort of read Coke Factory. And here is a young man who has perhaps an intellectual disability. Um, and he is given agency to tell the story mm -hmm. um, and to take you through the story. And um, even writers who've written for a long time read that and they go, you can do this? You know, mm -hmm. can, you, can you really do this? You take the character who perhaps in his world would have the least agency and you give him equal footing as a young person mm -hmm. uh, with guardians you give him equal footing in a community that may take may some may consider him less than mm -hmm. um and on the i guess on the surface you would think that that move would be simple but it's a very a very complicated way of writing a story of telling a story and telling multiple stories because she also not only does she tell the narrator's story but she also says something about the guarded the, the guardians mm -hmm. um it makes you wonder where his parents are it tells you something about um, the community, which actually that story is set here in Lexington, mm -hmm. but you know this character has has a past, and his people are in Hazard, Kentucky. So it's like you know his people are in Appalachia. So there's a story there, um, this sort of layering of story and how he came to to be where he is, and his agency of telling his own story is um, adds such layers of of complexity um, to that work. And she does it, it's, it's easy to, to teach that story because pedagogically you can see all those things happening at once, but she she does it over and over again in, in her other work too. Mm -hmm. And as you say, it is revolutionary because the, the separate story or like the, the story about that narrator, for example, uh, an oppressive story that says that he can't tell his own story and that mm -hmm. his story of his life and his story of his community is not, doesn't even exist, let alone have um, power 
and authority, that story, the story within which he can't be the narrator, that's the story that we live in, right? That, that's the story that coheres all of the systems of oppression that um, would have would have it be that, you know, that your grandmother, my grandmother can't be the omniscient God, that, um, yeah, that I think that you really, when you, when you say that it's revolutionary, not merely in the sense of that it's innovative or that not everyone's doing it or that it's different, it's revolutionary in the sense that it actually exposes and displaces the actual story that we're living in, fighting in, that's fighting right. us, disappearing us, you know, like that, um, that has an impact on our bodies mm -hmm. every moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, telling, storytelling as, as agency um, and not just for the sake of, of, of storytelling is, is something that's preeminent in her work and something that I try to, to hone and, and begin to, not begin to, continue to practice um, in, in my own work. Um, you know, I sometimes tell students that don't use first person unless you mean it. <laughs> and what I mean by that is, is there a reason? To, what's your reason for the story to be on the tongue of this particular character? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that there, so you, you, you should begin with two stories, at least two. Yeah. And then be open to these, listen like you were saying, listen for these areas where you can open, you can sort of unpack um, even more layers than that. Yeah. Mm. And then the layers, I feel like we're inside these layers, you know, like there's the layer of what's at stake in this symposium around canonization and around who is included and excluded from mm -hmm. a canon of Black women's writing or a canon of, of American literature also. And yeah, I do think a lot about, I mean, Sister Dr. Rao Malika Imhotep was, was saying about feeling, and actually a few folks on the, on the panel earlier today were talking about feeling welcomed by the storytelling, the existence of storytellers, the, the story, storytelling as a primary form in Gail Jones's work as something that for those of us who be around storytellers, <laughs> you know, like a, who, who um, have been loved in that form mm -hmm. is, is welcoming. And so it, it also, I just wonder about the language of how we can talk about Gail Jones's work that doesn't always default to um, difficulty, illegibility, you know. Um. Yeah, I've been interested in that. And, um, you know, I didn't, I, mean, I don't remember if I asked a question when I was on listening in earlier, but I kept formulating questions in my mind, like, um, and I was a little slightly disturbed that people um, were hesitant to teach her, like they, we're trying to figure it out or, um, and I understand all those reasons. Um, I think part, perhaps part of the call is to be as unflinching uh, as she is in her telling to be, mm -hmm. be, to be unf unflinching in, in our teaching of it um, and our conversations of, about the work and to, you know, move into some of these these areas. Um, perhaps I wasn't doing it out of being brave, but you know, as an untenured um, um, professor, I jumped in and said, "We're gonna. This is what we're we're gonna look at this book, and here we go." And um, 
I was teaching at a, a small sort of white Christian college and, um, and, and I dove in and, um, and it, it was okay. <laughs> uh, I didn't get fired and uh, um, I, I tried to be as unflinching um, in my teaching of it um, as she is in her, in her telling. And so we, you know, put Corregidora at the top of the syllabus and, you know, and there we went uh, and dove, dove deeply. And I think that um, part of the secret if there was one, you know, perhaps naivete was one of the secrets, but the, but the other secret was um, to establish a community. Um, and it didn't have to be a community of agreement, uh, but a, 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 a community of, of res mutual respect. Um, and then I put the students in, in clusters to have conversations on their own um, before we came together as a group. So once we formed a community of, of mutual respect and they were able to, to read the work um, and act as a group and then have their alliances with their, their small groups, um, we were able to sort of unpack the text and move, move forward. Um, and I taught white rat too, but um, I think that I get so upset. I think her work um, deserves, I'm so um, honored and in all the young scholars um, who've put this together because her work deserves this and deserves more. I, I think our, um, eyes and minds and hearts have to be as unflinching as her storytelling is. Mm -hmm. oh, I love that. I love that. And, and I think that circles back around to, if we're talking about, you know, being, being writers and um, I think we're all, they're always flinching, right? We're always flinching like, oh my gosh, <laughs> uh, my editor's going to see this. Oh my gosh, you know, um, my agent's going to see this or I don't have an agent and I don't know if they're gonna, you know, what they're gonna say when they, when they see this. Um, and I think, I think that is a lesson um, in her work and her approach to her work is to be, to take risk and be um, unflinching. And I think there are layers, you know, I think that looking at the family and looking at generations, looking at, um, I think there are ways, going back to what you said, like how do we get away from just talking about um, her work? I see it often in my colleagues um, as I'm sitting around and probably say, well, like Gail Jones on my syllabus and they kind of go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love that book, but you know, or I love those books, but, you know, um, but I think community, um, you know, there's more, a lot more um, to her work than just the scariness of it. I think, uh, was it Alma who talked about the scary, sometimes scary, like, it, and it's definitely there and that's a layer of it, but there's a lot more. Um, to it than that. Yeah. And like, what is the closed door and what is the, what is the space? I mean, speaking of a community of mutual respect that, as you said, and as, as Evie has, has underlined in the, in the chat and thinking about the reading group that that was the first, um, was the first way, you know, that we moved into this symposium. I think that that's so important, right? I, I think that that's, it's revolutionary what you're doing as teaching Gail Jones's work and this the stakes of like well what I mean then you don't want me right is is saying that yeah if I'm functioning within a form that means I have to preemptively flinch even thinking about creating a space that's worthy of this work for us to be able to engage it 
that is that is part of the insidious and unacknowledged story of what it is to read, what it is to teach, you know, mm-hmm. all, all of those things. Because I, I think about, I was thinking about listening, um, which is not to say there's no difficulty and there's no illegibility, but I, I was thinking about listening to my grandmother and my grandmother is in a place in relationship to her memory where my listening practice means I'm listening, I'm listening to her basically tell me the same things again and again. And I'm listening for these small differences that emerge that I that mean so much and that I, I learned so much from as she tells me again a story that she's told me a zillion times. You know, the fact that she's told me this story a zillion times is part of is important. That's part of the poetics, the repetition, the retelling, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the who I am, because I'm a person who's listened to this person <laughs> tell her this again and again and again. Right. And also she's changing it in the retelling and I'm attentive to that. And I can't necessarily be attentive to that if I'm like trying to have a, I don't know, <laughs> 15 minute conversation. It's not, it's never a 15 minute conversation, you know, and, mm-hmm. and that, um, but what, what would it mean? if I didn't arrange my life so that I can listen while I can listen to my grandmother say whatever she's going to say and attend to it in a way that I'm not skipping over things in my listening, trying to rush to the next thing I want to ask her, but I'm able to really be there and notice that, oh, wow, she used this word this time. I, I never remember her using that word. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's because she didn't say that word before, or maybe it's because I wasn't ready to hear her say that word in, in this story and really get it until the zillionth time. Yeah. Um, or perhaps there was something, you know, a flower or, you know, exactly. keep using that, there was a flower that she passed by that opened this thing up. Like, exactly. You know, I've, I have been listening to my old people um lately and trying to interview them um because you know there's an age gap between me and you so my old people are really up there and um and to have been with someone your whole life and to hear something new yeah um and that sort of repetition Petition and replication um, that happens with these generations is what Gail mimics that in her work. She doesn't mimic it, she replicates yeah. that um, in her work. And um, I think, I mean, I hope that this symposium will help us move her more solidly into the canon. I just, and you know, and I know I'm biased. I'm biased as, as a Kentucky writer, as, you know, as a whatever, I'm, I'm as a uh, Gail Jones, ite, whatever, whatever you, (laughs) whatever you want to call it. Um, I've carried her books around like the Bible. It's been so, so inspirational and helpful in my own life, in my own um quest as as a professor and, and in my own quest as a as a writer um but i continue to not understand it um and why she's not at the top of the canon um in her rightful place yeah or her work should be at the top of the canon in its rightful place in its own peacock chair <laughs> Uh, (laughs) yes I mean obviously you know obviously I'm committed to the same thing um I my dad would always say just because I'm biased doesn't mean I'm not also right that's true (laughs) that's true (laughs) there's there's that um but I think that what it requires you know like requiring 
us to come together differently, requiring us to stop. I mean, even the length of Palmares, the length of mosquito, you know, like it, in some cases it's like, stop, you know, and, and again, this is the revolution that that's moving through it is, is that we should reorganize, we should reorganize our lives. We should restructure or abandon our institutions. We should, um, I mean, because the question of why it is not is, I think that the shameful answer to that question, I'm not exempting myself from this shame, is that it means that we are more attached to what capital allows most easily to flow and reproducing that than we are to being transformed by the work of our great geniuses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No matter what we say, you know, even if I say, well, I'm black feminist intellectual, this is what my whole life is about. If I don't have time to read Mosquito, that means something about what I prioritize, what, you know, what, what that means. And I'm not trying to say that, you know, people don't have 10 and 12 jobs and that people, <laughs> people don't have other people whose lives they're responsible for, but it could just mean like, if it's going to take me eight years to read this book and I'm just going to read <laughs> three pages a day, you know, like that there, there is, um, what would that commitment mean? And mm -hmm. what am I committed to instead of that? And in some ways, it's, it's a commitment to the systems that we have, mm -hmm. an unspoken commitment to that. But I think connected to that, for me, is realizing that there's a commitment to who I already think I am, mm -hmm. that I'm not going to be on the other side. I, listen, I know I'm not who I am on the other side of Palmares. Like, I'm just not, I'm not the same person that I was. And I just, you just have to say goodbye to whoever that was mm -hmm. there, you know, not to say there's no trace, but just that, no, what I thought was possible before, where I had gone before, what, mm -hmm. what opportunities I had to recognize my, my wonderings and my not knowings. I, I could either go on that journey or not go on that journey. Mm -hmm. And so it, it does come back to me to that, to that word surrender. It says that I, I surrender, I surrender yeah. to Gail Jones, but I, but it's not like I'm surrendering to the person Gail Jones. I'm surrendering to this flow of black women's genius mm -hmm. that I believe, I believe that the salvation of our species on this planet comes from that flow. I've committed my life to it and yet I'm forever learning better how to just how to surrender to that which mm -hmm. price you have not surrendered to that how I'm you know the person lying on the yoga mat and I'm supposed to be in full relaxation pose but oh turns out my fists are clenched you know and what's that about and you know surrendering more mm -hmm. and the great gift is that Gail Jones has given already and, you know, continues to give and will continue to give, I hope, so many opportunities to, for us to be transformed. And yeah. And to pass that on, you know, I think that this symposium has helped me think about what can I do individually? Um, you know, I sort of have struggled in the trenches for a long time, being sort of defiant um, and not wanting to come into the fold. Like I've been a writer in residence for a long time at various universities. Um, but now I'm a full professor. So what does that mean that I'm just gonna take the money in? What does it mean? What it, One of the things that it means having been a part of this symposium and I've been thinking about it um, since I was contacted to be a part of it and or knew that it exists, um is commitment like you you're saying like there should be you know whole classes around her work and you start 
where you think you need to start, like the stories, White Rat is a perfect place to start if you're afraid. And I think a lot of it is around fear. If you're, if you're afraid of what's gonna happen to you, <laughs> if you're teaching in, in an institution and, and students say, guess what we're reading? We're reading Eva's man or we're reading, you know, whatever. Um, start with the stories. Why not have a class around her entire body of work? Um, there's so many things that you could talk about and so many ways that you could, could do that thematically. Um, and even in, in communities, I think it's a, a good place to, to start because you know one of the things that we used to do at the bookstore was we would celebrate Gail's birthday by uh, inviting people to read passages from the book, the books. Um, and so we would have people to bring their books and if they didn't have them, we would purchase a copy for the group and then we would pass it around and they could read from whatever they would like to read until everyone had a chance to, to read something and to talk about it. I love that. Um, so there should be a myriad of ways to um, continue to celebrate um, this body of work, which is, the greatest body of work. Uh, and there's so many people who are etched in, and I'm not gonna say this person over this person, but she should be there with them, mm -hmm. etched yeah. in stone in the canon. Um, and you know, there are various canons and there's, there's, there are problems with the idea of a canon, but since there is one, and even, even in our canon, uh, She's definitely at the top of our black women's canon, even though some of us still have a fear of teaching her, um, but we don't have a fear of teaching other people at the head of the canon, like walk mm -hmm. into the light. <laughs> walk, in, <laughs> walk, in, <laughs> walk into the light. We can support um, each other to do that. I mean, I, I, I think the other thing that I, that I wanna acknowledge you for is being unflinching and teaching Gail Jones's work. And by the way, I, I read White Rat because you said read White Rat. I had not read the short stories ever. Mm. Um, I don't think I even knew about the short stories until you were like, everybody should read this. And I was like, well, Crystal said, I, I, you know, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm doing it. I, I was like, you know, literally that day I was like, okay, you know, this is, I'm acting on it. So I want to say that you already are passing it on and you already are, you've influenced me in, in this way. And that there's the unflinchingness of being like, yes, I'll teach this. But there's also the bravery of actually living your creative life in such a way mm -hmm. that doesn't prioritize other people's easy consumption. And I see you also doing that. And, um, and, you know, I had this interesting compliment from another writer recently who was like, uh, Alexis, you know, I have all your books. I have them on my shelf, barely read. And he was like, because, and I was like, that's, I was like, is this a compliment? You know? um, but what he said was, I, I open, I open any of your books and I read one page and it's enough for me to mull over for like weeks and oh, you know, wow. and I you know I was like huh I'm so happy about that <laughs> you know like like I um I don't think I thought about it explicitly or I sat down and be like I want to take books and it's going to take you the rest of your life to finish you know but what a wonderful thing you know like <laughs> what a wonderful thing if there's something on one page that can do so much for someone that they say this is enough and I'm going to come back to it and this isn't going to be a book that I just read through it's going to be something that I return to mm -hmm. and the different versions of who I am across time get to return to it and um there's something very expansive in that and, mm -hmm. and so when I think when I think about your work when I think about Gail Jones's work I think about that that it's not, I mean, I do think it's important for folks to read all of Gail Jones's work, but I don't want to put something on it that says, 
you want to read it fast or you want to skim it or you want to just get through it or you got to be able to you know give me summaries of all these different things um and what and there's so much of it like i think that that's that's something that people don't realize uh, either that there 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 are plays and there are poems and mm -hmm. there are uh, there's criticism and there's of course the fiction uh which i think the fiction is is the spine of it but mm -hmm. there are lots of wonderful bits to chew on and i think the other thing that um, we often have issues with, and I think even in, in teaching that sometimes, you know, the professor uh, is supposed to be the person in charge, right? And they're supposed to know everything. And I think sometimes we don't like teaching work that we don't quite understand, mm -hmm. but I love the idea of always thinking about community. Yeah. Like that's what you do in community and, and I'm vulnerable in that way to my students. Like, and they said, well, what does this mean? Mm, I don't know. In the context of these other things, what do we, what do we think that it, that it means? Like, how do we feel when we read this? How does it connect to the other things that we've read, the other things that we've read by this same author? Like, where do you think this fits? Uh, and um, I think it's okay for us, whether we're, we're in, an institution or not to not understand the work. And I think that's another thing that makes it even more um, canonical. Like why is it okay to not understand other authors and being challenged by other authors, um, but to be afraid of Gail's work? Mm -hmm. That's right, because those people don't understand Ulysses. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but you're right. The same claims yeah. are not made. The same exclusion is not um, perpetrated. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're supposed to let the people ask. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Let's um. Hi. Um. Thank you so much for that extraordinary dialogue. Um. My name is Iana Hawkins Owen. My pronouns are she, her, he, him. Um, I am sitting here appearing as a light skinned black person with uh, white rim glasses, uh, big hair with some curls sticking off to the side, uh, books, um, some art by my mom behind me and some small plants. Um, I uh, wanna thank you both for allowing us to witness this dialogue um, usually the co-organizers and I are putting out small fires or texting each other rapidly about the things we love happening on screen um, or this person's on deck, oh, oh, and trying to get ready. But this convening, it brought to us this moment of peace and a moment of stillness where we could really just be here with you. Um, and in Tala's words, we were just wrapped by your dialogue. So thank you for cultivating that. Um, so we just want to open things up to um, question and answer with the audience. Um, and I want to encourage the audience to take a few moments to process what you've heard. Um, you can submit questions in the chat where everyone can see it or through the Q&A box where just um, panelists will see it. Or you can DM me for an anonymous question and I'll read it aloud. Um, and I just want to say again, uh, so much brilliance can be stunning, as in, I am stunned or speechless, and how do I come back to a place of language, um, collect myself to keep this conversation going? Um, so I'm speaking sort of for myself, but maybe for everyone. Um, so I invite everyone to take a deep breath and come back. Um, and yeah, please uh, freely use any of those three question options, and I'll bring them forward. Um, so I'm going to take like a, an intentional moment of silence with all of you now to allow people to think. And I have a couple anonymous questions already uh, for when we start up. Okay, um, I hope we're all feeling good. I'm going to put the first um, question back in the chat um, and read it aloud. What is the role of trust when listening slash being open to the stories that come to us and need, <clears throat> sorry, and need to be written or shared out through us, even 
and especially when those stories, quote, don't make sense to us or to others. What can we learn from Jones about trust in storytelling as a storyteller? Mm. I think I have a, um, my simple, very simple answer would be, in answer to the question would be to ask the question, um, is this true? You know, is this true? Uh, because it feels like the truth. Uh, if it feels like the truth, um, then you know, if you're if you're a writer and you're trying to understand, um, it's your duty to to try to figure it out. You know, if it's true, if it feels like it's true, then you have to figure out why it's come to you, what you're supposed to do with it next, where where is the little pinprick of light. Uh, that you can enter to try to find out more about it. Even if it doesn't make sense. The sort of unpacking of it. Sorry, y'all, there's a very loud train <laughs> that's going by. And I guess a very long train because it took a while, but... Um, I think that's actually really appropriate because when I think about this, I love this question. And when I think about trust, when those stories don't make sense to us or others, I'm, I mean, I've just have, have been having this experience now where I, in 2020, I wrote, uh, every day I wrote poems about constellations and in that process I was learning about the names of those constellations in some ancestral languages in particular um, indigenous to the Caribbean and South America so it, mostly in Carib and Arawak languages these constellations right and so I just was doing that that was my daily practice that was how I was starting the day and I have this like stack of all these poems that I wrote and I'm like, what even is this? You know, like, what is it? What is it for? Really not knowing. And having even moved on to other daily practices, I'm in a different practice right now. And just yesterday, I was like, oh, this is, this is for me about daughtering and like new archetypes of daughtering. And you know, the poems are really visceral. There's a lot of rage, there's a lot of grief. There's like all of this stuff. And back many years ago, um, when the first book that I published, Revolutionary Mothering came out, I was like, there's something about daughtering. And then I was like interviewing people and I like some of y'all are here who <laughs> I've interviewed about daughtering and like, what do you think about that? And I thought it was gonna be like a linear move from one to the other, but it, I just went all around the world into the sky, all into different languages, all sorts of things to come back to like, oh, this was the book I needed to write about daughtering. And now I like to look at it in a whole new way as whatever it is. And I still don't really, really know what it is, right? So I say that to say, to give a real life example, as my niece would say, real life, a real life example of not making sense to myself, which is basically my state of being. <laughs> um, and I don't think I would be able to do the daily practices I do, let this stack of, when I say stack, like it's sitting here, it's sitting here on my desk. These are they, you know, like, um, and it's been sitting there, like, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it's for. Um, allowing myself that is an act of trust. And it, it wouldn't be possible if I was like, it's a waste of time unless I can, you know, say something that will make this marketable to somebody to publish soon. I wouldn't do it. Most of what I do in my life, I wouldn't do it if I didn't trust that my creative and intellectual process is valuable for its own sake. It is. I don't know what it's making possible. Now, I do feel, you know, there's the accountability and there, there's all of those things. And I do feel like it all ultimately is useful. But if I have to know beforehand how it's going to be useful before I allow myself to do it, it's not going to be useful in the transformative way that it needs to be 
useful to my communities of transformation. And that that's, there's something very vulnerable in that. There's something very, um, there can even be a dissonance, you know, when people are like, what are you working on? And it doesn't necessarily feel like I have space to be like, no idea, <laughs> you know? Because <laughs> um, you gotta say something, right? That's like, sounds very smart. And then people are interested in the blah, 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 blah. But what I have had to learn to trust, and I'm still learning this, is to trust, you know, and Crystal, you spoke to this earlier, it, there's, there's divinity, there's the, there's the greater than, there's the love flowing through that's intergenerational that I have to trust, and I have to trust it more than I trust the market within which my smartness is valued in capitalist terms. I have to trust that the first thing I said, the divine, intergenerational, unnameable, breath of black feminist genius, whatever that is, that is which I have a faith spiritual relationship to, that is what sustains my life. I have to trust that more than I trust that like people thinking I'm smart is what sustains my life. It's a capitalist dissonance in that because I'm constantly obviously paying bills and you know like this, this is happening, this is happening. Y'all think I'm smart. I'm here as one of the keynotes in conversation with one of my favorite writers, you know, like, all of that, but I think that the that on a surface level, I can be like, yeah, because of the marketability of my ideas, I get to be here, but it's not really why I'm here. There's reasons I'm here that I don't even know yet, and I also have to trust that the way that I practice, doing my work in a way that it can offer whatever it offers to you, when it offers it to you, even though you didn't necessarily think like black feminist lessons for marine mammals was something <laughs> that you wanted to engage or what, whatever it may be, however random it may have sounded. That's, that's what it is, right? That's what opens up those possibilities, but that never happens if I don't trust what I don't understand. So those are just some words about trust <laughs> that mm -hmm. are inspired by this, this powerful question. And I do see, I do think that that's part of the affirmation of Gail Jones for, for me, because I don't, I, I think it's important that she has um, enacted certain forms of refusal. They may not be the exact same as my refusals, but has not said, well, I got to show up and sell this. And I got to give you, I got to be available to you and, and give you reasons and convince you that my work is valuable. That's not why we're here. That's not why we've been impacted by her work. We've been impacted by it because she did whatever it was that she had to do in order to do her work. So um, I'm grateful. I'm grateful to that tradition. And Gail Jones is absolutely a part of that tradition. Mm -hmm. um, there is a comment in the Q&A box I'll read aloud. Um, it says, just gratitude to everyone, and especially Crystal, for championing Gail's work. Um, and I definitely want to echo that. Um, the next anonymous question I've pasted in the chat. Um, I'm struggling to form my question, but I want to ask Alexis if breathing, labored breathing, a throwback to Ramalika Impotep presented earlier in Jones's work has influenced or is in community with Alexis's work on breathing slash breathing women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I guess my name is in that question. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I wonder what Crystal thinks about this though. Um, because yes, I think so. I mean, I think that, you know, the, the, the piece that I read talks about what's possible in one breath. Absolutely in Ramalika Imhotep's presentation around work and the physicality and the, the labored breathing and the um, struggle, you know, with all the memory that's moving through, especially when the stories that are being retold are traumatic. Um, I definitely see it as in community with the work of, of Black feminist breathing because for me, the practice of Black feminist breathing, which um, for folks who may, who may not know is, is repeating words of ancestors who have impacted my practice of Black feminism, repeating them 
repeating them 108 times as a meditative practice. That, that's, that's what I'm calling Black feminist breathing. It comes from an insistence on reclaiming my breath from the, the messages that surround me. Like earlier when we were talking about, um, and Crystal was sharing how revolutionary it is for the narrator of a story to be able to narrate their story and tell their, tell their story. It's stories about why, <laughs> another train, why I'm not good enough, why I'm not smart enough, why I can't do this, why I can't do that. Those stories that are part of the process of, of um, part of the process of systems of oppression reprinting themselves on my body and uh, conscripting my body into their reproduction. I am forever seeking to reclaim this entire cycle, the breath cycle, the life cycle, the ocean, water, mountain, stream cycle, all, all of the cycles. Um, and what I know tunes me in energetically to that reality of, of what I really believe in are the words of, of, of these ancestors. Now, Gail Jones is not an ancestor, um, and certainly still, you know, the, so many of, of her words have, have been mantras for me. And I do think that the repetition, the working with it, what we've seen here, the creating poetry from it, the erasure work, the close reading, the reading out loud, you know, that um, you all, that you model Crystal in terms of the community readings of Gail Jones's work. I do think all of that is an opportunity to reclaim our breath. And I do think that our breathing, the very fact of our breathing gives us a responsibility to be a place that this loving, transformative, unruly tradition moves through. Mm. Um, there's a question for both of you from that came through I'll repeat. I'd love to hear Alexis extend her discussion of storytelling structure and layers to the genre of poetry in which both she and Jones work in different ways. Is there something different or more or less that storytelling does within the context of poetry? And for Crystal, the question might be how Jones's poetry has informed her fiction writing, if at all, or the question, oops, or the question might ultimately be what is poetry in Jones and through her in your work. Yeah, go for it first, Crystal, because I mean, you know, your poetry. Mm, yes, please, please. Go. <laughs> um, well, I think in, in the poetry, um, I wanted to sort of pick up on one of the threads from, from just the prior question. And I think it pertains to, uh, to this as well, is that the way that that Gail puts, allows for breathing. Like, yes, the physicality, and maybe you, you all talked about this earlier when I missed the, the session, but um, the physicality um, of, of a breath, when she, she always makes a point of saying that someone is not saying something. You know, she said nothing or, or he said nothing. And so um, in a way that leaves room for breath, if somebody's not speaking, uh, whether they're gesturing or signifying or whatever they're doing, there, there's a, a space there. And so I imagine that to transfer to, to form as far as leaving a space on the page, whether that's um, in the rhythm of poetry or in the rhythm of fiction. Um, I, I write fiction as poetry to the point where, because language is so, so important that I, I, count, I count syllables and um, try to get the rhythm of a conversation um, right. And it, it sort of flips both ways. Um, thank you for the question because it, my, my poetry is very much informed by storytelling and, and the narrative. Um, and I think my fiction is very much informed by, by poetry and, and rhythm and the rhythm of, of language um, and getting the speech, speech right. And white space, the way that space is used um, in, in both fiction and poetry. 
Yeah, that all of all of that resonates so much with me too. And um, I mean, just the short answer is yes. I I do think that what Gail Jones says in this particular piece, but also what, what she does in her body of work as a poet and as a playwright and as an author of fiction and as a critical thinker and as a theorist is is within this logic of, of st storytelling and the possibilities of retelling. There is a mobility that I think for me ends up determining my relationship to form that is, well, maybe this does have to be something that looks more like a poem or where, where people are more cued in to read it in such a way that they understand the kind of travel, time travel that can happen with the echo within one word that we would associate more with poetry. I, you know, I'm so disloyal to genre and you know, all, all, all of my, all of my things are all of my things, but I think that the primacy of the listening it's also a listening, it's also a listening for form and ceremony, like what the ceremony is. The ceremony is the form in which this can happen, in which we can remember this, in which we can move here to here or um, remember that here is here even though we thought they were different places. And I never really know what that ceremony is, is going to be. And that's important, you know, that that, that openness to, to what it could be or what it might require, however long it takes me to get to it is, is really important. And so what Gail Jones is talking about here also really comes in and, and in, in chorus with what you said about discernment, Crystal, is what, what is the thing, like I showed you, I showed you this stack of papers, right? That this stack of papers is um, at least some of them, not all of them, because some of them, you know, you ain't gonna never see them because that was just part of my process, but if some of them belong to us, belong to this flow of black feminist unruly breathing, whatever, whatever this is, and, and this community of affinity and the other communities of affinity, as it is the ethics of the storyteller that come in when I say, what is the form in which I offer it to you such that you can live in it with me and we can all live in it together. That's not a form of obviously pieces of paper sitting on my desk <laughs> in, a, in an unorganized pile. There's a different, form, what's the ceremony for that? And it, it has, I do see what Gail Jones says about the storytelling within the storytelling, about the intergenerationality of it, about the ethics and accountability within it, about, about the fact that I feel the imperative to create a space inside the ceremony of my work where we're equally responsible for being transformed once it exists in that form. I'm responsible for getting into that form, but it has to be a form in which like the community that Gail Jones describes where we are, it's not more about me than it's about you at that point. So, you know, that's, that's, what, I'm, that's what I'm working on, but I do see, see Gail Jones's work in general, but this particular elaboration of what storytelling is and makes possible in its layers, I see it as very, very helpful for my poetic process, all my processes. Um, we just have about 10 minutes left, um, but there's uh, another question that was in the chat, I'll resend. Um, and then I'm gonna lump in it with one of my own poorly formed questions. Um, so the question that came in was from when will critics and scholars get to a place of focusing on Gail Jones' work, opposed to using her personal life to drive, promote, or engage her work in the mainstream literary press? Um, and then to squeeze in there, you could take it or not. Um, I was 
really in love with the idea of the birthday gathering reading and um and also um alexis i'm really familiar with the different ways you've cultivated community across wide spaces too and so i'm just curious to hear more about ideas how people can commune over the power of gail jones work and i'm thinking too of in the opening session the rutgers university reading group that um felt so powerful too from from so far away thank you both yeah, I mean, I think readings, whether they're on her birthday or on the anniversary of Rigadora, or I mean, just every opportunity we should organize around them and and um, make a happening. And, and to question, this is like the um, most frustrating thing of my entire life, even more than my own personal shit. Like it, it. Um, and he knows this, I don't know him personally, but we're often on social media in back. I mean, I never met the man, but we're always, every time there's an article that comes out, we're like in back messaging. And, and I just, he can't see me, but I'm just like this every time because I just don't understand it. Um, and sort of recently I've been like unknowingly in, included in some of it um, as a person who's from Kentucky and as a person that people want to interview um, sort of unknowingly, but I, I'm not going to let that happen again. I want to make sure that um, her wishes are, are honored and that it is the work that comes first. And it shouldn't even have to be her wish to keep doing it because we don't do that shit to, to anyone else. And we, I mean, by this American letters, like we do not do that to other people. There's so many white men who have this heinous um, backgrounds and, and no one's like holding up their personal lives uh, before they talk about their work. Their works are canonized and they talk about their contributions to the canon, which is what we should be doing with her work. Um, and I just will not, you know, I couldn't help unknowingly participating in it, but I, I will not, I, I don't know. There's no answer to that question. Like we don't know how to, how to crack that open and make it stop, but it does need to, need to stop. Yeah, I mean, I, I would, yeah. My short answer to that question is hopefully now hopefully now, <laughs> like, can we say that this convening has given evidence of a critical mass of people who have creative, beautiful ways of engaging Gail Jones's actual work such that there is no excuse from this moment forward. That's, that's what I would like it to be now, when, now. Um, and I think that that is also part of what this question of gathering and communing um, I think that that it's it's connected to you know that the spaces if if it's true that folks are not engaging gail jones's work on its own terms because people feel inadequate and afraid because of the depth of it the transformative whatever like that if that's true which maybe it's not true maybe it's about the other things that um anyway but if that's true i think that there, this gathering is also evidence, and those gatherings that you've been doing, Crystal, are also evidence of the possibility that together, with the community of respect that you that you mentioned, and as a community of respect right now, we can say it's okay. It's okay that I myself am not, I'm never going to be able to explain everything that Gail Jones ever did, every choice that she made in her work, all all the characters and their complexity. If I believe I'll never be able to just personally do that myself, it's okay. We're holding it in community. And the fact that I am held in this community could give me the bravery to go ahead and do the piece of it that is my piece to do as part of this community of respect. And so I, I love the, if you have your book, bring your book. If you don't have a book, we have a, we have a collective copy. We're passing it around. And just if, if it's this paragraph and you're just 
bringing that paragraph into the space with your voice and that and that's your role in this moment understand that that's enough and that that Mm -hmm. is worthy because these words are priceless so well that's what I say I think I think sorry I think there's infinite ways but I I do think that the coming together is is important and powerful Mm -hmm. and I think it's important to recognize like we are are primarily um, scholars of one kind or another gathered here, but I think it's important to recognize that Gail's work also gathers community, that everyone who's engaged in her work, um, when we would have those those circles um, at our bookstore, it wouldn't just be the local scholars who would come. There would be people who would, who would drive in from, um, from other states, but there were also mail clerks and secretaries and other people who were there because of the work and not even just because she was from Kentucky, but um, that her her work provides room for community. Just like she provides room for her characters, her work provides room for community. Thank you. I think that is a beautiful note to come to a close on. Um, I want to paste in the chat information about tomorrow, but first say um, everyone, wherever you are, to join me in thanking Dr. Wilkinson and Dr. Gums for sharing their time and allowing us to witness this conversation. Um, And uh, yeah, please express that in the chat. Thank you both so much. Um, And uh, to all attendees, please rejoin us the same Zoom link later tonight for an experimental session called Lightning Talks at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. Um, This session is a first come first serve opportunity to sign up and share up to five minutes of any of your thoughts about Gail Jones's work or any of your own creative writing in response to her work. Um, And we also have the link to the creative writing prompts that we've been circulating in response to some of her texts, um, Song for a Nino, uh, Mosquito and Eva's Man. Thank you all again so much and I hope to see you later tonight or tomorrow. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you. Dream come true. Bye y'all.